Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, October 7th. Your co-moderators today are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Our topic for today's show is our featured teacher, who is Michael Foster. He's our special guest, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula, who will introduce Michael and ask him the newbie question. Hello everyone, I'm so glad to be here with you again today and to introduce Mike Foster. Mike has worn a variety of hats in his more than 20 years in education. He has taught grades 1 through 8 in elementary and middle school before moving into his current technology coaching role. Mike leverages his professional experience with the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards as well as involvement in state and national level assessments to help teachers reflect on their professional practice and create new paths for learning. Um, Mike and his family live in northern Colorado where they enjoy community outreach with several nonprofit organizations. This has resulted in a menagerie of animals in his household and a connection to a rainbow of local organizations that benefit children outside of schools, such as United Way, the Bohemian Foundation, and the Humane Society. I had the great pleasure of meeting Mike and getting to know him at the DEN Discovery Education Network Summer Institute this past um, July, which was held uh, in San Diego. Mike is a gentle giant of a man whose love for what he does is very apparent as he shares his knowledge with others. He quickly became known as Big Mike by all the attendees at the Den Summer Institute and was awarded the prize Den Finger for all of his contributions. Mike is currently the educational technology facilitator for the, I think it's pronounced Purdue, school district in Fort Collins, Colorado, home to 20,000 students across 50 schools. The easiest way to reach out to him is at M. Foster PSD on Twitter. And Mike, the newbie question for you today is, what does Classroom 2.0 mean to you, and how do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Take it away, Mike. That is a fantastic question. Uh, Web 2.0 means to me that the walls have become transparent in the classroom. It gives me a chance to not only reach out to professionals on beyond the walls of the room, uh, but to also take students on beyond on guided experiences. Um, I think it's a perfect analogy for the way that our world is shrinking. Uh, that's what Web 2.0 means to me. As far as using Web 2.0 tools uh, in the classroom, it's kind of like a buffet as far as I'm concerned. There's so many good tools out there uh, that there's no way to know what they all are. But uh, just like a buffet, be willing to sample uh, little items and uh, give them a try. Decide whether you're going to keep going back for those or try something new. At this point, I would like to um, ask anyone else out there if uh, they have anything they'd like to add on that. In the meantime, here's my contact information if you'd like to add me to your professional learning network. Uh, that is probably the top answer I had on one of our poll questions, that, uh, that second poll question. I had a hard time deciding between that and librarian. Um, I feel like uh, librarians are the inside go-to person, and my PLM is my outside go-to. I'd like to jump into uh, what it is I do and uh, why I think uh, Paula might have identified me as somebody who uh, could come on Classroom 2.0 today. Uh, the job that I do now has to do with partnerships in our school. The hat that I wear is technology coach. And here's what we share with people when they, whenever they ask, what is it you do? Uh, 
Uh, my job is to support teachers and students with the design and implementation of technology-based activities. Uh, so I guess the uh, technology flavor that gets added to what's going in the classroom. Uh, there's a lot of ways that that might look. Uh, this is something that we share out with our schools uh, because really what it is is that it's about developing trust in the schools. Um, I am entirely by appointment or by invitation in my job role. So as you can imagine, that might seem overwhelming, but how, are you, how am I going to get invited to be in the schools? Uh, yet in practice, um, it's really hard to uh, get around to all the places I would like to be. Uh, in order to do that, at the beginning of the year, I try and uh, visit a lot of the schools and uh, just make sure that they remember that I'm available as a resource, as a teaching peer. Uh, I'm technically a teacher on special assignment. Uh, it's really great that our district has seven of us that are available in this role for the 50 schools um, where they've made us teachers without our own students. So pretty cool. It is a lot to uh, cover. I have seven schools where I am the first point of contact. Uh, yet, there's other schools where we have developed relationship. Uh, as, I, as I said earlier, it's all about trust as far as I'm considered. Uh, if one develops trust with teachers, then they see you as an additional partner on their teaching team. One of the other hats that I wear when I'm not out in schools is providing uh, professional development from the lens of technology uh, out for schools. Uh, over the years I've been doing this job, uh, it originally started uh, with some pullout instruction as the starting core when we set a baseline in our district. Um, at that time, we uh, were starting to go one-to-one, -one, especially in the secondary classrooms. And then at the elementary level, um, we were also adding on classrooms uh, one grade level at a time. And so what we did was some intensive training with those, uh, with each grade level as we implemented a new grade each year, uh, one or two from elementary, one from middle school, and one from high school until we had everyone covered. Um, that was pretty intense for everybody because there were a lot of subplans to be written uh, for that pullout model. Uh, once we were able to accomplish that and include everybody, we shifted to a model that had less impact on the classroom, and that's where we're at now. Uh, we still do offer baseline trainings. We call it digital innovation pathways, but we work really hard to offer those courses as much before the contract year begins, right in August, um, uh, late July, early August, so teachers don't have to write plans. If they would prefer to have the rest of their summer and write one day of subplans, we offer them in September. And then we have a second day that happens in January or February. That way it has a minimal impact on teachers. Uh, what it looks like during the year, though, uh, has to do with uh, the ed tech classes that we offer, and they primarily happen in after, to, after school time frames. Uh, we offer typically 20 to 25 different varieties of classes so that we can reach all grade levels and content areas uh, per semester. Uh, so we have a fall catalog, and that's only the ed tech classes that are linked out here um, if you choose to click out through uh, the links. Um, makes it a long day for us sometimes because typically we're done about 6.15 at night. But the whole idea, again, is people feeling like they have another teammate. Uh, if you'd like to see what the catalog is here, I'm going to actually jump over to my live screen here and share out my desktop here. Um, as far as professional development is concerned, one of the things that we offer are ed camps or 
uh, many conferences. At this point, our conference is called Super Connected, and we've been doing this for several years uh, with the neighboring school districts. So it's not just our district, but it's really a partnership of Northern Colorado school districts coming together uh, to offer trainings. Um, the last couple of years, we've been trying to organize our thoughts around the four C's in education. This year is creativity. And so what we're featuring this year are all things maker spaces and such. Uh, we have pulled in uh, a local Stanford fellow named Mark Schreiber, who's going to be our keynote. Uh, the cool thing is then he's going to stick around and offer some sessions as well. Uh, he's also going to be speaking next week to uh, our secret weapon, which are the library media folks next week at their at their meeting. So he's going to give them a taste of what's coming in November. Um, that's a really cool way to uh, get people hooked into what we're doing. Uh, we have people registering from all the local districts nearby, and the other people that come to it typically are the pre-service teachers from several of the local universities that we work with. Uh, we have Colorado State University here locally in town, and in a neighboring city nearby, we have the University of Northern Colorado, both of which have vibrant education programs. Uh, there are times that I get to go out and be a guest lecturer in their classes. Uh, but uh, we try and also pull them in by having them come to the conference. Pretty, it's a pretty neat way for them to see it. The other piece that we offered, I'll just go ahead and show you a tile of what that looks like so you get a flavor for what the classes are here. Uh, we have interactive whiteboards, the kind that we use in our our district is smart, so we have uh, professional development on that so people can get proficient. Uh, part of our one-to-one -one initiative was also putting interactive whiteboards in all the core classrooms out of our budget. And then uh, that freed up some of the local building budgets to try and put them in the Encore or Specials classes. At this point, I would say most of our classrooms have interactive whiteboards. Uh, unfortunately, music and art were some of the later classes to get them. Uh, but once they saw that we were continuing with support, it went from there. Uh, other things that we uh, that you can see that we offer have to do um, with collaboration, uh, working with digital media, um, capturing student voice through digital poetry. Uh, we have. Uh, Lots of new Web 2.0 tools uh, that are constantly cycling through. One of the newer ones for our district is PlayPosit. So um, whatever the flavor of the semester is, if you will, uh, we try and offer courses in that so we can go deep on what those Web 2.0 tools are. Uh, we've found by doing that, not just giving them the tools, uh, but really showing them how to bring it back around to education. Uh, we've found success and those continued to be used uh, as we have moved forward. I'm going to come back to the slides here. Uh, good question. I see over in the chat that there is questions of advantages of PlayPosit over Edpuzzle. Um, I would say that uh, both of them are fantastic um, tools. I would be confident using Edpuzzle just as much as PlayPosit. Uh, the advantage we have is that the founders are, have moved to the Denver area, and so we actually have met them face to face, uh, given them some ideas of enhancements, and um, they in turn have actually come up uh, to uh, co-teach some of our professional development classes. It's pretty powerful when you get one of the co-founders in the room helping show the features. Uh, so that's why we're using PlayPosit over Edpuzzle, but both of them are strong. Speaking of Web 2.0 tools, here are the pro tools that uh, we are currently offering to our classroom teachers. Uh, there's so many that are out there that are what I would call freemium. 
and uh, meaning that you can have availability at a limited level for free, uh, but some of the really powerful aspects of the tool are available uh, in the premium version. Uh, in order to uh, try and help support that, uh, we do a lot of test driving of Web 2.0 tools in our job, uh, seeing as how uh, we're not having to plan minute-by-minute minute instruction. Instead, we try and find uh, ways to plan technology integration into the various grade levels. Um, to do that, we find willing guinea pigs that would like to test drive some of these pro accounts uh, and we push into those classrooms in order to uh, work with those teachers and get to know the tools. That way we have access to students. So if you take a look here um, at the ones on the screen, uh, you can see we have everything. We have Play Posit. Uh, we do have Pear Deck, which allows you to insert uh, questions into slideshows and such and make slideshows interactive, kind of like Play Posit makes videos interactive. Uh, we use WeVideo for um, the iMovie, if you will, of uh, making classroom videos. Uh, those accounts are available to anyone in our district uh, so that they can capture student voice digitally as well as use them for blending their classrooms. Um, one of the favorites, especially in world language as well as some of the other content, core content areas, uh, is Pixton, which is a cartoon maker program. Uh, it's pretty neat to see uh, Spanish 1 students creating cartoons uh, as a way of showing their language skill. Uh, they usually bring it to the next level uh, because it's not overwhelming coming up with that amount of text. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, visual arts represented. Uh, Bulb is actually also a local company here. So um, as far as making portfolios, for example, in art classrooms, uh, Bulb are websites that are uh, geared towards uh, visual arts. Uh, Wixie is the online version of Pixie, if you've ever made any of those types of slideshows. So that's a sampling of current items that we have available. It's not the only things that we have handy, uh, but um, those are a good sampling of the accounts we have. Uh, we have a very brief application process, uh, basically uh, some affirmations of yes, I promise to use it this many times per month, uh, I promise to uh, give feedback and such, uh, so that way we have some kind of leverage to um, ensure that when we're buying accounts for people to actually use them. Um, so those are just some examples of the electronic things that we offer. One of the other fun parts of our job is that we actually get to do some uh, physical items as well. I just noticed uh, button makers coming up on the uh, the chat. We actually do have three sizes of button uh, with our button makers that we have available for checkout. Um, so speaking of librarians, imagine in your checkout system having reservable tools. Uh, it's kind of neat. They just have to remember to switch their, their catalog in the library system from their particular building over to our curriculum area, and the ed tech tools are in there using the keyword ed tech as a search. Uh, just wanted to explore that a little bit, so we're going to pop over just to show you a little bit of the goodies that we have in addition to the buttons. Uh, by the way, the sizes we're using to answer um, that question, Maureen, is um, we have one and a half inch up to three inch button sizes, so they can choose. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of those items that we have available. Okay, so here's our digital tools catalog, and so we invite teachers to come here to peruse and see what's available, and then kick on over to the library reservation system to get items. Uh, 
I'll just start scrolling down a little bit. These are some of the items that are very popular in terms of moving students forward with Web 2.0 tools. Uh, right now in the fall with the beautiful leaves changing, uh, we have a lot of ecology education that takes place, seeing as how Fort Collins is located right on the edge of the foothills. And so it's not too hard to take field trips up into the mountains. Um, a lot of times they will do excuse me, GPS activities when they're up in the mountains. And so we do lots of scavenger hunts, both at school to get used to using them there, and then uh, to do learning activities up in the mountains. Uh, we actually tie those in kits, uh, which are literally suitcases that look like flight attendant sized suitcases, um, you, as opposed to a checked bag size that are available for uh, checkout and field trips. Uh, 3D printers are very popular. One of our recent professional development classes was focused specifically on art teachers and using 3D printers. Uh, we get a pretty good discount from a local 3D printer making company, Lulzbot. Um, I can actually almost see it from my house, it's so close. Uh, they, uh, the reason we go with them is they are so fantastic on our, uh, on supporting us whenever we have any issues. We just bring them by and they will swap out parts for us uh, and keep them running. So uh, that's why we've gone with uh, the local machine is we're able to keep them out in the schools a high percentage of the time because of the support. You can also see that we have lots of coding kits. Uh, we have a variety of styles of robots that are available. Um, one of the more popular ones with primary students are the bee bots uh, or the, the mouse bots which are very similar in terms of the buttons on them. That's a great place to start with kids learning sequencing. Um, and actually a really great entry point where we've had a lot of success developing uh, trust relationships with primary teachers. Uh, they feel like we're there for them and, and they understand how sequence fits into um, the curriculum. Uh, iPads we have available for checkout as well. Those are so popular, they're hard to get. Uh, moving down, I'm going to show that we do have uh, robotics kits. We have several different styles that are available for when students uh, graduate from the primary robots. So we try and actually have um, a whole scope, if you will, and a sequence to using the robotics uh, where they transition at this phase uh, from uh, programming with the buttons on the machine to uh, learning to do block coding and such. So there's a really nice progression and we're finding that by the time the kids get to uh, middle school or through middle school, uh, they really have a solid foundation with programming if their teachers have uh, been checking these items out. Um, What's really neat is that then they tend to graduate to the Spark Fun tools, uh, which are uh, basically building onto computer breadboards, Arduino boards, and uh, they're coming up with amazing things that they're doing programming. In fact, one of the fantastic things that they've learned to build um, is a service project where to, uh, one of our middle schools and a middle school in a neighboring district are working together to uh, build LED uh, lights to send over to underprivileged uh, students in partner schools over in Africa so that those kids are able to use those lanterns to study at night because they're disadvantaged without electricity and not able to study. Uh, that's one of those examples of uh, where the kids' empathy is connecting with the things that we have handy. Just real quick before we move on and head back to uh, what we're looking at. Uh, the green screens really have given the language arts teachers the feel that we are helping them access their curriculum at a deeper level. Uh, it's pretty fun to watch middle schoolers 
chomping at the bit to write stories when we can use the green screens to put whatever we want in the background. Their imaginations come alive when we can actually literally put them in the picture. So imagine Forrest Gump meets creative writing in the classroom. Uh, those are highly popular. Uh, we also have video kits available if uh, teachers are doing digital storytelling. Um, there's a lot of compelling items that have come out of that. Uh, th there's a few more items that you see that are available. The other one that really is changing the way we're doing business are the science probes. Typically those have been seen in high school classrooms, but what's fantastic is by having them available uh, for checkout, we've actually seen them come all the way down to third grade in terms of uh, being used regularly in the classroom. That's really one of those where our partnership and ed tech comes alive uh, because it's kind of intimidating thinking of data collection tools, but when they have us come in and do demonstration lessons or partner lessons, uh, science probes are actually a really great entry point uh, for teachers to see that we are partners with them. Uh, the virtual reality has been highly popular as well. Um, those are literally the same viewers that we grew up with, uh, people that may remember getting the um, the view master and putting the little disc in so they can imagine there were places. Um, these days they have iPod touches in them. A lot of schools when they're writing technology grants are getting their own in the building so that they can have virtual field trips on their own. Uh, that's uh, been some of the partnerships this past week. I've gone out with schools that have been awarded some of those and helped them set up their virtual reality tour kits so that they could either do Google expeditions or once they've really gotten their feet wet there, uh, they have been moving into using uh, Web 2.0 apps like CoSpaces to literally uh, program and create their own 3D data representations and then going to the goggles to actually get inside and walk around in their own virtual spaces that they've created. Uh, it's a really compelling story that uh, I would sure love to share with you. I'm going to take a moment to walk back over to the tech training to show you what I mean. Um, those those tech trainings I was talking about that take place in August and September are day one options. We gave four flavors for people to take. Uh, inquiry, where they were using data to, uh, to present what it was that they learned, and that's the one I'm going to join. Uh, we also did digital publishing. We did blended learning and design thinking or engineering thinking focused specifically on what it looks like in the classroom. Uh, in this inquiry and presenting data on our agenda, what I would like you to see is that after we explored these science tools, these Web 2.0 tools, we ended up going into co-spaces and creating a uh, data a data representation. Um, we put a tutorial right on there. We had viewers available during the, the training and um, then people had the opportunity to, to um, create their own. Uh, here's some of the things that came out of it. The electoral college map uh, was one geared towards uh, teaching civics. Uh, what's cool about that, that's not one we built, but it was one that uh, they found compelling, was you really get the sense of the electoral college when you're trying to walk through Texas uh, with the viewers and then you move up to Montana and walk through the same thing. The, they really get a sense for how what population density is and how that has an influence on elections. As far as ones that were created by people that were taking the class, uh, there were some really neat visualizations that they came up with. Uh, the 
the oil one, I'll just go ahead and actually go into and navigate so you can see just what the students are experiencing. Uh, this was made by a fifth grade teacher as an introduction to what uh, she was using with her students when they were trying to um, when they were trying to understand um, economies. And so taking a look at it, the black area actually is a world map. Uh, with our streaming, it's not coming through very well. Uh, but the kids were able to navigate around on the map and get the idea of uh, what, who are consumers in terms of uh, the world oil. And they could see how we're so far ahead of our neighbors in terms of what was used um, and how our use dominates compared to the rest of the world. Uh, so that's just an, one example of something that came out of that collaborative day. This teacher turned around back in the, the classroom um, and had them collect some, some data and then go into co-spaces to visually represent it so that they could get back in. All right. Once teachers are really comfortable with the, uh, the peer relationship that we have, uh, we begin a gradual release model of working with teachers closely on areas where they feel comfortable. Uh, we just were talking about the co-spaces co example. And uh, then we put a little bit of peer pressure on them. As you can see, our ed camp is coming up in another month. It's actually on a Saturday. Um, so this time in one month, we'll be at our conference. What's really neat about it is uh, that we are looking at it through the lens of creativity. And uh, one of the teachers that came up with those came up with those co-spaces activities at the high school level, and another teacher who's using them with the elementary level are going to come in as presenters. So uh, those are what we consider success stories uh, when it shifts from them getting comfortable enough to invite us into their room to turning around and being the uh, peer advocates who are showing their own stories of what's happening in the classroom. Um, that's really the narrative that we're going for, is building internal capacity and actually getting to the point where they become advocates for the Web 2.0 uh, tools that are transfor transforming the learning that's taking place. Um, we do, uh, our, the trainings that we do and the push-in is entirely by invitation. So it's 100% opt-in after the first few years. There are teachers that still say that they don't have time to integrate, um, that there's too much pressure on the curriculum, um, and, um, and that they may not be comfortable with it. That's really where it comes down to trust and rapport. Um, the other sneaky thing we do is that by having these digital innovation teams in each building, um, what's happening is uh, we're getting enough people in certain buildings where it's taking on a life of its own internally and where they may not be comfortable with we as external teachers coming in and partnering. Uh, we are actually it, they may be comfortable talking with their teaching partner who's in the room next door and making the time that way, especially if they see, oh, my partner is trying this new idea. I'm willing to try it if I'm doing it with my teaching partner holding my hand instead of Big Mike coming in. If that makes sense, does that answer your question, Maureen? OK, thank you. Uh, hello, Wes. Glad to see you're joining us from Oklahoma. Uh, I was lurking on your Twitter yesterday. Good to see you. 
So that's what Super Connected is about. Most of the presenters that we have take that we have there are classroom teachers who have grown to the point that they want to be the advocates and share their stories. Uh, we find that a whole lot more compelling than the ideas that we generate in our p professional development. Um, hearing what's happening in other classrooms is uh, really the way to go. Uh, it's uh, pretty neat that people are willing to do a Saturday uh, and come in and share their story. Um, to sweeten the pot, our district has a little bit of professional development funding um, that is available that if someone is willing to come in and share their story, uh, we can pay them for a few hours of planning out of that professional development budget. Um, to sweeten the pot and help convince them that they have a story worth sharing. Pretty neat. Uh, one area I wanted to go into um, is to move the focus away from technology. Um, we really uh, push that we are uh, trying to help them implement the ISTE standards uh, as far as developing empowered learners in their classroom, showing students how they can be digital citizens, uh, how they can construct knowledge and such. Um, and so you can see the ones that are here. Uh, that is one lens that we use when we are going in and co-planning. Usually what it looks like when we come in is that we sit down at plan time with a team or with an individual teacher. And they sometimes are a little surprised that as a tech coach, our main area of focus is looking at um, our district standards, which we call the uh, the five dimensions of teaching, that is actually something that we have adopted that's from outside of our district. Uh, we have uh, four district end goals, which are our um, our our district overall goals are written around. We look at the lens of the Colorado Academic Standards uh, or the national standards and the content areas that have them. We look at these standards. Uh, we also look at uh, TPAC as far as looking at how content, pedagogy, and technology come together to create that sweet spot. And then we also look at the levels of rigor that are found in terms of the SAMR model. And so when the conversation really centers around there, uh, teachers tend to relax because that's more familiar territory. Um, when that takes place, then what happens is we begin tossing golden nuggets onto the table uh, with the coaching. So we try and find that one thing that they're willing to try. Um, in fact, I use that exact language, I, um, just like we had with uh, poll question three, I literally asked that question. So now that we've done this planning for this unit, have you identified one thing you'd like to refresh where we can pull technology into it? And that's how the uh, that's how it starts in developing the trust relationships with the teachers around the district, uh, whether it's by team or by individual. Oops, I jumped pretty quickly. There we go. All right. Um, when a teacher has identified a specific lesson where they would like to try that one thing, then uh, we try and put some structures in place to help guide their thinking. Uh, this is an example of one. This is um, part of a lesson refresh document. Uh, this is actually one from a kindergarten classroom. I have permission from Mona to share this with you. So it's in the live binder if you'd like to look at the whole thing. You are also welcome uh, to use it as a structure for thinking about how tech fits into uh, being that one thing you'd like to try in a beloved lesson you have. Or, as is, as, as is the case here with Mona's kindergarten classroom, last year for her a new idea was making STEM boxes for her kids to use um, with different kinds of manipulatives for them to explore. And uh, this year, uh, what she would like to do is start blending it by 
uh, finding compelling videos that can go with them. So it guides the use of the box a little bit, so it's a little bit more structured. Um, basically, it's almost uh, 12 tubs that she has that she puts out at centers during um, her um, during her center rotation in the morning. And so uh, I will be coming in and working with her uh, and sh sharing with her videos that I've researched before we've met, if that gives you an, a an example of what one of these one-on-one -on -one partnerships would look like. Sometimes the partnership involves working with other district leadership, and um, that either could be the person responsible for that curriculum content area, uh, such as the curriculum coordinator for science, um, who's been a good partner to us. Uh, I work with the social studies uh, content expert, the music content expert, the world language content expert. The seven people on our team have tried to divide and conquer. Uh, the science one is uh, the science person is somebody I've worked with for a few years, so I wanted to show uh, what it looks like when it's built out. Uh, what we do is we come together and um, co-lead uh, district curriculum teams. So when um, the science building reps get together, uh, we are there at the meetings, and we have a part of the meeting where we get to share out. Um, and usually it entails co-planning together. Um, what you can see on the screen is Gizmos is a uh, Web 2.0 tool, uh, which are simulations that are in math and in science. Um, since it's the, sci the science teacher, uh, or the science site that we are showing, um, from the lens of science uh, items, we've pulled those into the training. And Laura has been our science expert, if you will, in making sure that we are targeting science standards when we are looking at the training. Uh, the one that I showed you from DIP Day 1 and Inquiry and Data, we found science standards that fit at uh, fifth grade, eighth grade, and high school that we pulled in uh, for the lesson um, on the Earth being tilted on its axis. We used vernier science probes to capture data from um, heat lamps. And so uh, the, the teachers literally were capturing data uh, with lessons that they were able to turn around. We did have elementary, middle, and high school teachers come to that gizmos, um, that gizmos training, as well as participate in that dip day one strand of collecting data. Uh, the other way that we partner is as uh, special events come up, we work together to coordinate there. Um, she's more outward facing on science as well. So she partnered with the physics department from Colorado State University and then partnered with us to um, to share with the eclipse that we recently had the first day of school in August. Uh, we work together to get uh, eclipse glasses for all of our students and such, for example. And then um, we were live streaming it, and we actually sent somebody on our team up to an area in Wyoming where they had the totality, along with a fifth grade science teacher that was uh, from that area natively. And they live broadcasted from from there during the totality event where it got dark. So that was kind of cool uh, for them to see. Um, I know it's really hard to see down at the bottom, but you can see there's a tile for elementary science, middle school science, and high school science. So we do try and uh, differentiate what we do in those regards. Um, as, as far as upcoming opportunities, we really try and target the specific audience. Uh, as far as outreach to community leaders, um, Laura works really hard to uh, find people at the city, for example, that can come in uh, to work with teachers when they are studying wildlife uh, or uh, water, for example. And so that's how those partnerships 
work. Um, and so that's how we partner with other district leadership or with people that are interested in one specific content area. Um, I alluded a little bit to coming in sometimes and working with grade level teams. Sometimes that's in a building and sometimes that's with offering staff development that's targeted at a specific grade level. Uh, what you see here um, are two projects that have come out of a partnership with second grade teachers uh, and then later on we added on fourth grade. Uh, one is the Our Town Fort Collins project. Uh, this is because you really can't buy curriculum when you're teaching about your local community. Uh, teachers were trying to find things that they could use on Teachers Pay Teachers and we said what if we did a professional development where everyone brought their best ideas together and we built a website as a local repository. Um, it actually was such a popular idea, we wrote a grant to continue the project and develop some videos to put on it and such so that it's actually an AV library in addition to just lesson plan ideas. That's what our town Fort Collins is. Um, we did that with second grade. Fourth, fourth grade got envious because they also teach Colorado history and they said we want the same kinds of things for our grade level as well. So uh, the next summer we did professional development for both second and fourth grade and then we've begun articulating the curriculum vertically by um, having teacher experts come in and share their ideas. Um, the beautiful thing that's happened there is our schools have changed their their outlook on what they're teaching from a silo mentality to a collaborative mentality and um, the second year when they came back a whole lot more people came loaded down with boxes of items that they thought would be worth getting onto the site um, into the repository. One of my favorite examples from that uh, fourth grade session last year has to do with the Japanese internment camps we had here in Colorado in World War II. Um, a lot of our local farm produce that we use nowadays are from uh, Japanese American owned farms up and down eastern Colorado. Uh, so a lot of the names were very familiar to students and uh, we were looking at it, what it was like to be an interned Japanese American, either first generation or second generation, and then um, it helped the kids get an idea of what it must have been like by hearing these firsthand stories from historical Colorado residents, some of which are still alive today and you still see occasional articles in the local newspaper, for example. Um, the teacher brought in her unit on that where the kids uh, did two-person uh, summaries and uh, two-person poems, sorry, uh, to summarize what they learned. For instance, uh, two children would stand up front, one person would represent a first generation and one person would represent their child and they would, um, they would tell uh, a two-person poem. That's an idea that came out of the state, or sorry, the National Social Studies Conference where we thought we'd bring that idea back uh, from the National IRA Conference uh, to the local conference. Uh, you can see that another idea that reached out of that was um, that empathy was such a powerful idea that uh, this past summer uh, two second grade teachers wanted to share which books they use for teaching empathy in their classroom. So they designed one day of professional development where they were the there they were advocating. Uh, here's the books we use and the activities we do, and uh, participants that came to learn in the session were encouraged to bring their one book that they like to use or several books and they ended up collecting them in a slideshow of book covers and um, ideas that they used to teach empathy. So this uh, teaching empathy through trade books I believe is uh, there and available for you to take a look at. Um, you can click through the Our Town Fort Collins site and get to it as well. Uh, they are listed over here on the side as well. Um, even so much as a list of favorite read-alouds by 
uh, by content or by topic are examples of things that the teachers have put together. As you can see, we've gone from uh, technology into um, other content areas. So our job is not exclusively technology, but any chance we see where we can bring technology back in, that's what we do. At this point, I believe I am out of time. Um, I've rambled on for the entire time, so I want to turn it back to questions. Thanks so much, Mike. I did collect questions along the way, a couple of which you've answered. Let me go back to the top. The tools that you shared at the beginning, are they able to be used on both computers and mobile devices? Um, many of them are, yes. Okay. Um, we, uh, a lot of those tools have an app version that's mm -hmm. available on iPads as well as a web version. Um, for example, uh, speaking of the four C's, when we were teaching uh, communication, Seesaw was one of those, and I'll go mm -hmm. ahead and put the link on it right here. Let me. I believe that was featured a few weeks back. It was. Um, uh, it has a web component and then the app component. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, some classes that have a, just a single iPad in them. They put it at a center during their daily five instruction. Uh, one day it's there at the math station, the next day it's at uh, the reading station, and so on. And uh, the kids use the app on the iPad to um, gather first person their read aloud or their thinking on the math. Uh, it's been a really great way to get the parents to be able to see first person what's going on. Uh, for uh, the other grades, they're actually using it um, on their um, PCs. Mm -hmm. So uh, our world language teachers have jumped on board with that too. Oh, I'm sorry, Paula, to yeah. see that your district blocks these. Uh, um, that's, a, in my opinion, a battle that would be worth fighting uh, to get that one back. Mm -hmm. That's really been probably the most popular Web 2.0 app we've had for primary grades. So that's one question. What's another one? Are any of I think you touched on this early on. Uh, are any of your schools one-to-one, -one and what devices are available in your schools? Sure. Um, it started out that we, we after four years, ended up one-to-one -one at our high schools. Mm -hmm. After three years, we were at our middle schools and in grades three, four, and five in our elementaries. Um, we, pa we were fortunate enough that our community passed a mill levy to support tech in that way. It was written for the scope of 6 through 12, uh, but through being really careful with what we buy, which are the lion's share at this point, PCs, we've been able to save enough money to add additional grade levels on, which is how we've gotten grades 3, 4, and 5. Mm -hmm. um, we are not one-to-one -one below third grade, uh, but each time we pilot new devices, such as Chromebooks or iPads, um, those items that we pilot, if they're not adopted, end up getting turned into carts available for checkout mm -hmm. in the primary grades. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in that way, we're trying to reach everybody. We have uh, iPads available for all levels for checkout. Um, a lot of our primary classrooms have worked with other funding sources to get carts available. Um, Chromebooks are mostly in primary. Um, and then we have PCs. Uh, we actually have uh, the Dell education model, which is around $500 uh, that we've been able to have for grades um, third grade and up. They are they stay at school in the elementaries, and they are checked out to students like textbooks um, in middle and high school, so they go home with the kids. Mm -hmm. How does your re reservation system work? How long can teachers check an item out? Uh, the standard window that we have for checkout uh, for technology is uh, two weeks mm -hmm. as far as the 
um, the standard for all of those items I was sharing with you. Uh, with the iPad uh, carts, um, it is typically three weeks because of, of what it takes for setting them up. Yeah. Um, they get them for about two and a half out of those three weeks because we literally re-image the iPads between classes with the apps that they request. Okay. Um, and each year, whatever is the most popular, we get more of. Whatever items seem to be too much to uh, manage, uh, we look at who checked them out the most, and we have a lottery for uh, them transitioning into the classroom, such as our Lego Story Starter kits. Um, they were very popular, but they were too much work for us to uh, inventory every time they came back, so they got adopted out into various schools. Great. Um, this teacher was confirming um, your um, process, I guess. A am I understanding correctly that in your district there are tech coaches who push into the classroom to help guide activities, or do they just train teachers and teachers conduct the activities themselves? Actually, I think it's a combination of both, but that was the question. It is a combination. Mm -hmm. um, there are seven of us uh, that can go out and push into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to zip back a few slides to uh, share what that looks like. Um, here we go, right here. Um, when we push in, it can look like us demonstrating a lesson. Um, mm -hmm. It can be for planning or um, it can be, as is the case of those STEM boxes on the lesson refresh, where I'm doing the research in the background, and then when we meet, I'll just share with her the information that she asked for from me. Okay. Um, and then if she wants me to be there and do the lesson, I will. Uh, we try and do a gradual release model where um, after we've been in one or two times for that same thing, we ask them to try and take over. Okay. If they're not comfortable, we're willing to continue to come back. Um, unfortunately, what happens is some of our favorite things we love to do, we don't get invited back anymore because <laughs> the teachers become confident doing it th themselves. Mm -hmm. Is the SparkFun robot like the Edison robots or more advanced? Um, it's very similar to the um, to the Edison robot. Um, that's why we have such a variety of different kinds that are available. Mm -hmm. And what it actually, frankly, comes down to is the comfort level of the teacher to start with. Mm -hmm. um, the B bots are just pushing buttons, and the kids learn how to program them with literally a deck of cards that have um, arrows on them pointing forward, backward, left, right. And um, and then do act you know a, a lightning bolt for doing a specific activity, and so they literally start with them with playing cards, mm -hmm. and then they push the buttons to match the cards, and then it goes from there up to uh, them learning to program uh, at coding.org and so on. Mm -hmm. Are your teachers evaluated on their use of technology in their classrooms? Is it a required it is, school teacher goal or objective? It is technically there, but it, um, in practice, uh, the teachers are just looking to, the principals are just looking to see that there is technology there and they're not evaluated uh, quantitatively mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the practice has been. Um, it's, uh, it's not forced in any means. Mm -hmm. What kinds of kits do you use that are aligned to elementary science standards? Uh, the the our district has the um, 
has FOSS kits that we've been using for mm -hmm. years, and those go out. Uh, what we've done to enhance those at the intermediate elementary level um, are the vernier science tools. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what we have done is built uh, tubs uh, that use specific lessons that are aligned to the state standards for those grade levels. And they come in a pre-packaged kit, kind of like a FOSS kit, yeah. uh, where the probes are in there. Um, and the lessons are all there. And so we try and make it as easy as possible. Those are other areas um, uh, where we do that. What's interesting is that's also a great area where we have a partnership with Colorado State University. And they have a group called Little Shop of Physics, which actually travels around doing these amazing demonstrations. Um, and they work with us to develop kits um, grade level by grade level that target those standards. And um, we have sought funding from uh, the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, and such to fund putting one of those kits at each school that sends teachers to attend those trainings. Um, what's really cool about that is um, some of the money has shifted from buying every third grader a dictionary to um, still buying dictionaries, uh, but giving the kids these science tools mm -hmm. as well. Great. Uh, so that's a really neat partnership. Um, as far as primary grades, um, most of what we currently are doing has to do with those beginning robots, such as the program, mm -hmm. the bee bots or the, the mice, um, things that involve Legos and science, and also squishy circuits uh, for them to begin to see uh, at least uh, what the concept is of, of problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, looking up uh, St. Tom, if you Google St. Thomas and squishy circuits, literally it's Play-Doh, wires, batteries, and LED lights. Mm. Um, and uh, kindergarten and first graders love, love, love that activity. Mm. This goes back to the Ed Camp day. Uh, sure. Are you streaming any part of it? for people who don't live in one of those districts? Um, we do record some sessions, but unfortunately, um, other than the keynote address, we're not streaming it mm -hmm. um, because we have about, um, about 20 rooms going at once. Um, although I really like that idea for future planning mm -hmm. um, to go ahead and do that. Um, there's no charge to attend, and we've invited um, all the districts in a 50-mile radius. So um, although we're not streaming it other than the keynote, um, I'm going to bring that idea up to the steering committee. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Do you use any online learning for teachers or students? Uh, we do use uh, we do use some, and it's actually picking up steam. Uh, we do have one global academy where the students only come three days a week to the building, um, and a lot of homeschoolers in the district also make use of those services. Um, and in return, the lion's share of what they're doing is actually done online. Um, we use Blackboard as one of uh, the platforms for it, and then there are several others that uh, we use uh, when we're doing the blended learning like mm -hmm. that, um, um, depending on uh, depending on just how much is the online component we go that way. Um, we don't have um, we don't have one like well we do Edmodo. Uh, we have a lot of Google Classroom. Uh, as far as teachers managing online components of their physical classrooms. Okay. Do teachers have regularly scheduled meetings with the tech coach, or do they just 
schedule a meeting as needed? It is 100% as needed mm -hmm. by invitation from the side of the teachers. OK. Um, and uh, what usually happens is some buildings uh, really love it and we're there mm -hmm. a lot, and other buildings um, are not as into it, and we don't get there as often. Mm. Um, they're not required. There's, they're not required after we did the beginning baseline. Uh, the first three or four years, there was one. Uh, it was required of core teachers, and after that, it's been all opt-in. Mm -hmm. Um, usually, what ends up happening is they see other people doing stuff, right. and that's what causes them to want to do it rather that's than That's their being incentive, forced. yeah. Yeah. Do, do teachers see each other's lesson refresh ideas so they can help each other, like finding videos for that project? Um, we encourage that in that they collect their items into uh, a portfolio as they participate. Mm -hmm. um, if they're participating in our uh, digital innovation pathways, and um, we ask each of them if they are willing to uh, post it uh, either for people within their building to see or within the district to mm -hmm. see. Um, there's one example of that in the live binder, Aaron's. Uh, that's actually a PE teacher. And it shows the tech he's been using. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're even getting Encore teachers that are doing this. Hmm. Um, but um, we we do it by permission in order to share. Sure. Um, How long did it take to actually create Our Town? Was it primarily done during the summer? Were teachers paid to participate in the curriculum development? Um, that was actually done with um, some social studies pull-out money to begin with, mm -hmm. where we had uh, two sub-days, one in the fall, one in the spring, and teachers came together. And that was the seed that planted it. And then we had professional development that they were paid to attend if they opted in mm -hmm. um, the first week after school was out at the beginning of June okay. as a summer institute. Um, and we were in a little bit better financial position at that point. It got enough there that we were actually able to write an innovation grant to continue funding that and uh, get teachers to um, participate. And that was, that was all opt-in as mm -hmm. far as that was concerned. It was a passion area for a couple of local teachers who just really love our uh, local history and uh, love working with our city community uh, partners. Our local museum uh, jumped on board. Um, they gave us copyright permission to use their in the entire city archive, so yeah. all the mm -hmm. old photos going back into the 1800s. Um, all of our students have legal permission to use those in their presentations and such now. Mm. Um, so really, the partnership there is the magic that was happening there. Um, the State Museum, History Colorado, noticed when we added fourth grade and got really interested in taking that idea and sharing it around the state. Great. That idea has actually been shared at the state and national level. And uh, we've been presenters at conferences sharing that idea. Uh, it's one of my favorite ideas, actually, that uh, has come out of this. That's wonderful. Yeah. Or one of the most compelling, I guess I should say. Yeah. Do most of your teachers use a learning management system such as Emoto or Google Classroom? Yes. Um, the way I would divide it out is I would say uh, Edmodo we mostly see at the high schools and mm -hmm. some in the middle schools. Um, in elementary, um, you see mostly Google Classroom. Middle school, there's a lot of Google Classroom. And then in primary um, and intermediate classrooms, you see a lot of Seesaw. We don't have one unified LMS mm -hmm. uh, learning management system, but quite a few. Uh, this teacher is actually trying to put together a request for button machines. So do you use a, a make is the button machine? Is it American button machines or some other make? 
Um, I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to look uh, <laughs> because I don't know. So okay. I'm going to pop back over real quick um, to the catalog here. Um, let's see if Uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have to switch to Chrome because uh, I've got it bookmarked. As you can see, I did my homework there. So bear with me. You get to watch me actually go in the system here. And I will answer that button maker question if I if I can. Okay. Okay. At least I think I will be. Actually, let me put in ad tech. and see if it's behaving. Uh, you know, with me being um, outside of the district, I think it's mm -hmm. an intranet only, so uh, I'm not able to answer the question off the top of my head. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, so, that's an uh, intranet feature, so um, I can't answer the button one. Uh, so but I'm pretty sure it is, and it's a it's a, a United States company. I think it might be American Button Maker. Uh huh. Okay. I, off the top of my head, I can't verify that, but I think that's what it is. All right. Well, thanks so much, Mike. Those were the questions I was able to capture. And if we go. Well, as I learned from my student, uh, from my kids who worked at Chick Fil A, it was my pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for having me, and thank and, you, Paula, for nominating me. And uh, I'm now going to turn over the mic to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Mike, for those wonderful examples of things that are going on in your district and around the state. We have lots to learn from you. We hope you'll all come back every Saturday and join us. We have some great shows coming up. Next week, we're going to be celebrating Picture Book Month, which comes in November. And um, we'll have uh, at least one of the co-founders with us for that presentation. And we want to do that in honor of the founder, Diane de las Casas. The next week, Rustin Hurley, the amazing Rustin Hurley, will join us to share his insights about becoming a better teacher. Sarah Thomas will be joining us on October 28th to talk all about EDUMATCH and how you can get involved in that. November 4th, we're looking forward to hearing from Kara Martin, who has created some great things with Snapchat. Book snaps, gratitude snaps, and much more. And November 11th, we have an amazing librarian, Tiffany Whitehead, is joining us to share some great resources and ideas and strategies for helping our students learn about fake news. So come back and join us every Saturday. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher for a month by filling out the form here or from within the Live Binder or from the website. And uh, you can nominate yourself as a featured teacher as well. The video collection is on iTunes U. You can get to that from the uh, live binder. As you exit the session, the survey should open up in your browser. You can take the link in the chat or from the live binder. 
And at the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate, and it prints out with your name, thanks to Patty Ruffing, and she also sends them out. Please, though, request this to be sent to a personal email address, not a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to Mike Foster, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>